So hello, Mary. It is such a pleasure to have you here today. So I would love for you, and this is Mary Higgins with us today. I would love for you to tell us about yourself. First off, I'd love for you to tell me where you're from. Well, I'm from Boston, Massachusetts, and that's the home of the bean and the cod. That's the awesome. codfish and baked beans. And okay. to be honest with you, as a child, I couldn't stand either one of them. But now <laughs> I look forward to having them. So your tastes change. <laughs> so tell us what you do for a living. And mm -hmm. are you still in Boston? Yes. Uh -huh. I work as a nutritionist, and I also do some movies, small independent films. Well, that's super exciting. Well, tell us what you're doing as a nutritionist. Uh, As a nutritionist, well, I'm working remotely for a company that's actually in Florida. So I do Zoom sessions and telephone calls with people that want to help with nutrition. So as a nutritionist and as a nutrition coach. Excellent. Excellent. So have you always wanted to do this your entire life? Well, let me tell you my story. It's kind of interesting, you know. Yes. As a child, I was a very picky eater. And I didn't like to chew things. I didn't like to chew meat. I had my muscles in my face would get really tired. So if it was chicken or if it was beef or if it was hot dogs, it was all the same. I got tired chewing it. And on top of that, I didn't like vegetables and I wasn't crazy about fruit. So it's amazing that I even grew up, you know, but I did like some raw vegetables. I used to like raw cucumbers and raw carrots. And then on Sundays, when we had pasta, my mother would make celery sticks, she'd cut them up and serve them with cream cheese. So I ate those. So it was actually my mother's idea for me to go into nutrition. And I'm glad that she did, because I think it saved my life. Oh, wow. How, how do you think that it saved your life? Because when I got chronic fatigue syndrome, I realized that I was better off than other people that didn't have a nutrition background. It... Um, I'll go into that in detail later, but what happened was um, I worked as a personal trainer and a nutritionist at health clubs throughout the greater Boston area. And um, I started taking acting classes around 15 years later, maybe, because I just wanted to improve my social life. You know, I had moved to a different area and I didn't know anybody and I figured this would be a good way to make friends. So I was expecting I would be in community productions like I had been in high school. I used to be in all the plays, singing, dancing, and acting, and I just thought it would be the same type of thing. Well, it wasn't. It was film acting. So I had to relearn a whole lot of different things. When you perform on stage, you need to be very exaggerated with your movements, your head, your arms, your shoulders, and you have to have a voice loud enough for that lady at the back row, you know, next to the exit sign. She has to be able to hear you. So I had to relearn how to act because I was very expressive with my eyebrows and it was a little too much for the camera because the camera picks up very subtle things. It will pick up the tension in your cheeks and in your lips and in your shoulders. So you don't have to exaggerate quite as bit, quite as much. So I had to undo a few things like learn how not to use my eyebrows so much and not to cock my head to the side because that was a big one. I used to do that a lot. <laughs> and I worked with some independent film directors that are up and coming stars. Oh. One of them, Kate Carson, she's out in Los Angeles and she's a very good director. I played an extra in her, it was a film about Twilight series. There was a contest about creating a prologue to the Twilight series. Oh. And I got to be a dancer in the 1920s in her movie. And it was great working with her. And then I've also worked with another director named Adam Griswold. And I think he's sure to go to Hollywood soon. He's a very talented writer and director. And when he does his films, he just does it all with one camera. It's just himself. He's just amazing. And I've been in like five or six of his films. Well, so how did that get started? You started doing that in... In high school and I was in the plays in high school yep and then um, I was too sick throughout college to do that but then once I started getting my feet under me and returned to doing nutrition I realized I wanted to do something else but I, I wasn't planning on doing filming and I didn't even know that this was filming so it came as a big surprise to me 
and I decided I'd be open-minded and I'd try it for a few weeks. I had like six week programs, four week programs. So I tried it during summer and then I went back to it in the fall and I started being in, she had a sister company. I started being in her commercials and then it led into being in films. So it's been fun and I've made a lot of friends and I've learned a lot. Oh, that sounds super exciting. Super <laughs> exciting. So you now have a book. So tell yep. us about this book that you've written. Well, my book is called um, Too Tired to Cook, The Guide to Choosing Foods for Those to, to Boost Your Energy and Enhance Your Immune System. And it wasn't a book I planned to write, but it was based on my journey with chronic fatigue syndrome. I got sick with a virus when I was still in school and I had to see a ton of doctors in order to get diagnosed like many people with chronic fatigue syndrome. So I just woke up one summer day and I was not right. I had a very sore throat. I was achy all over. My eyes hurt from the light in the room. I was, I was running a temperature and um, I wasn't hungry. So I stayed in and I took care of myself or my mother did because I was living with my parents at the time and I just wasn't getting any better. So they took me to a doctor about a week later and I had some tests done and the doctor found out my liver was tender and um, my glands were all swollen up and down my neck. And he ran a test for mono and it's called Epstein-Barr virus. And it's one of the viruses that does cause chronic fatigue syndrome. And he just told me, take it easy. And the funny thing is, Bonnie, I remember that the Olympics were on that particular summer. So it must have been August. Uh -huh. and I remember how nice the water looked. I watched the men's water polo and the swimming. And that blue water was just so inviting looking. I just wanted to jump in. Of course, that's how you feel when you have a fever, right? Oh, right. <laughs> yeah. So it was like, at first I didn't mind it. It was just like, oh, this is new and different. You know, I didn't mind it. But then as time went on, I realized I wasn't even getting any better. I was actually getting worse. So I started getting more symptoms. And I'm going to tell this because I know there's a lot of people out there maybe listening that have COVID long hauler syndrome, and it's identical to chronic fatigue syndrome except that you lose your sense of taste and smell with COVID long haulers. So I had a back injury before this happened and it was a pretty serious one. They put me into a back brace because my legs were going numb on me. And my neck pain was really the worst thing of all. I literally had to walk around with sunglasses on because the light hurt my eyes so badly. And I couldn't ride in the car or I would get dizzy I would get terribly motion sick and the pain of the window open would kill my ears. And um, I, my brother was in medical school at the time and he wasn't, he didn't understand this. He thought it was a hypochondriac and my whole family did too. And then I started having trouble reading. And this is a very common thing with people that have COVID long haulers, it's called brain fog. So I'll give you an example. I would try to read a paragraph out of my textbook and I would understand the first line and then I'd read the second line. But when I got to the third line, I couldn't connect what I had read in the first and the second. So it basically made no sense to me. And my brain was just muddled. I guess that's the best word for it. Oh my. So I would read that paragraph and feel stupid because I couldn't understand what I was saying. Then I started having problems with word finding. And this is again, very common with COVID long haulers. I would start using a word that began with the same first letter, but that was it. I couldn't make sense. So for example, if I wanted someone to bring me a book, I'd yeah. want to say, bring that book over to me. But my brain was saying, can you bring the butter over to me? It's like, no. there's no butter in the living room. This is craziness, you know? So then I was sent to neurologist and the neurologist couldn't really find anything wrong with me. So then I really felt like a hypochondriac. And I continued getting physical therapy from my muscles because they were very weak. They were getting very, very weak. Before I got sick, I was doing ballet and that takes a lot of strength. But now my muscles were like starting to atrophy and especially the neck muscles, which couldn't hold my head up. So I would read a book laying down on the sofa. I didn't stop reading. I just found a different way to read. 
So I would lay down on the sofa with the book above my head and read. And it was a very tough time because I just was scared. I didn't know how much worse this was going to get. And the doctors really didn't know either at that time. So first I got diagnosed with something called fibromyalgia, which had no cure. And the physical therapist told me that I was like spider woman, that I had this netting all over my body from head to toe and that it was super tight. And so that when I moved my head, it was pulling on my back. And if I moved my legs, it was pulling on my neck, which was kind of like mind boggling. I couldn't really understand that. But I was going to Children's Hospital in Boston, which is a very good place. Yeah. And they then started sending me to a rehab hospital when this symptoms continued beyond six months and I was showing no signs of improvement. Well, in order to be diagnosed with chronic fatigue syndrome, I didn't know there was a criteria until I started researching for my book. So this is back in the 1990s. And you had to have a new infection diagnosed every month for six months consecutively. And then there was a bunch of other symptoms like headaches, sore throats, unrefreshing sleep, and brain fog, and infections. And boy, did I have infections. I started having ear infections that I never had as a child. And I began to have sympathy for the toddlers and the babies that have that when they're screaming in pain. Because believe me, I was ready to scream. <laughs> Mine was so bad that that open window in the car, as I mentioned before, would cause me severe pain and dizziness. And I also got strep throat and bronchitis. And sometimes I'd have two of those infections at the same doctor's visit, then pneumonia. And then on top of this was all the orthopedic stuff. So it was just a very tough time. I was getting excellent medical care, but I wasn't getting any better. So the big difference is it wasn't like being in school where you work hard, you study hard, you do your tests and you get an A. This wasn't working. It was just like I put all this effort in. I'd go to my physical therapy appointments, but I wasn't getting better. I wasn't in less pain. I wasn't getting stronger. No matter how hard I tried, I just couldn't make it go away. So I felt like a failure. And I'm sure a lot of people out there with chronic illness tend to feel the same way. It did a number on my brain. <laughs> As the months turned into years, things became worse. I mean, I started to lose friends because I was what I would consider high maintenance. They wanted to go out clubbing and I wanted to go out too. But when I got there, I'd start getting headaches, severe, severe headaches from the loud noise, the loud music, the perfume people, the crowds and the strobe lights, you know, those flashing lights. Yes. So I did have some friends that stayed with me and they were content to go to the movies with me. But even that seemed to be a problem. I was like the problem friend, you know, it's like, remember I told you I couldn't understand things. Right. So I'd go to the movies and I'd be constantly like bumping my friend and saying, why did he do that? Why did she do that? Yeah. Because I couldn't connect what was going on. Mm. And so that was not so great with friendship. It was very difficult. And then, of course, I couldn't dance because I was put in this very stiff back brace that ran from like the rib cage down to the tailbone. And the one thing, though, that saved me is writing. And I hope that everyone's hearing this who is going through a difficult time. Writing can really save your life. I would lay down on my side and I would just write curled up in a ball in the sofa or in a chair. And I had no particular reason for writing. I just felt like I had to get this out. I knew it was an unusual situation. I was terrified that I was going to be like this for the rest of my life. And I just had to get it out on paper. And at the time I had like very, I wrote with very large letters like young people do. So it's interesting to read it now. And it actually makes me cry when yeah. I think of the pain that I went through. How did you overcome this? What was well, that? You said the writing helped. Yep, it certainly did. But I had to go, I had to meet some other practitioners first. So I call those my rewards. <laughs> I used to read New Age magazines. I was one of these people that would read, read, read before I got sick. And when I got sick, I still continued to read even though I'd have to ask other people to interpret what I was reading. 
Yeah. So I read New Age magazines that featured holistic medical providers. And that's how I found my doctor. And um, I found an integrative medical doctor or functional medicine. And this is like one of the best kinds of doctors that you can have. These are medical doctors. They have the MD degree and they've gone back to school to study what danger the pharmaceuticals can do to us. Oh, wow. Pharmaceuticals have all kinds of side effects. A lot of times people are given a pharmaceutical for, drug for one thing and then some other condition pops up and then you have to take another medication for the side effects from the first medicine. Well, integrative medicine acknowledges these things and prevents that from happening. So they do use antibiotics, but for like a rare situation. I was given antibiotics for an intestinal infection in um, one of my pneumonias. But the problem was my doctor was two hours away. I had a two hour ride to get to his office and I had to go through subway because my parents weren't too cool about my seeing somebody outside the traditional medical sphere. They just didn't really support me on that too much. They did later on, but not at first. And I didn't trust myself to drive a car because I just felt half conscious all the time. And again, this is how people with COVID long haulers tend to feel. He had a nutritionist in his office, which was a wonderful thing. And I worked with him and he also, I worked with her and him. He had knowledge of nutrition, which was an eye opener for me because most of the doctors I saw before him, they'd give me a muscle relaxant or um, a painkiller or an antibiotic and send me on my way, but not this doctor. He was a specialist in chronic fatigue syndrome, and he saw each infection, not separately, but on a continuum. So he realized that the sore throat, the intestinal infection, the ear aches and ear infections, they all meant that something was wrong in my body, that my immune system just wasn't doing what it was supposed to do and that it was lacking some nutrients that would help it to work better. So what he did is he used homeopathy. Have you, have you heard of that? No. Homeopathy is giving someone a very tiny, tiny dose of a substance that brings on the same symptoms that you have. And we tried many different things. So I talk about this in my book, actually. I spend a whole chapter on it. And he also used TCM, or traditional Chinese medicine. And there were also herbs like American ginseng to increase your energy level. But the big difference in this doctor was that he addressed the GI system or the gut. There's a lot of information coming out now about the gut and the microbiome. And basically what that means is you have all these little critters in your intestine and they have to be kept happy. And the nutrients that we eat from fruits and vegetables are what makes those critters nourished so that they can do the job of protecting your immune system. Our immune system is right outside the intestinal barrier and there's just a one cell layer between it and our bloodstream. So there's a lot of things that can go wrong and antibiotics kind of pokes holes inside that barrier so that food starts leaking out into the bloodstream. So he realized this and he took steps to prevent that. He gave me something called probiotics, pro meaning for, and when you have the word antibiotic, it's anti equals against. So bios means, or biotic means life. So when you have the word probiotic, it means for life. Whereas antibiotic means against life. The antibiotics tend to kill off everything in our intestine. They're, they're not too selective. So you end up killing off the good bacteria that we need in order to stay healthy, as well as the bad bacteria that you want to get rid of. So I then joined a support group, and this is another reward. And that made all the difference to me because I was feeling like what I'd call a freakazoid. I felt like there was no place I belonged. I couldn't attend classes on campus anymore. My friends had nothing in common with me. They wanted to pile in the car and go to the amusement park or the beach. And I just couldn't spend that much time out. I'd get too tired. And it was just like I had no place on earth to exist and I, where I was not in pain and, and in discomfort. And my life revolved around doctors and physical therapy visits. 
And then as time went on, my friends were starting to get married. And I couldn't even get to their weddings because I couldn't sit up for an hour. I was just too weak. Well, I walked into this meeting and Bonnie, everybody was like me. At the time I got diagnosed, chronic fatigue syndrome had a negative connotation. It was sort of a basket diagnosis if the doctors couldn't figure out why you were sick and why you weren't getting better, they'd diagnose you with it. So the newspapers and the media were saying about chronic fatigue syndrome that we were lazy people and we were couch potatoes. But I found out when I went to the support group that they were wrong. I mean, these people were as active as I used to be. They were bikers, dancers, mountain climbers, runners, and they also had very busy careers. They were accountants and lawyers and teachers before they got sick. And one of the things some of them used to do was to go camping and lugging heavy equipment up mountains. I mean, that's far from being lazy, right? Right. So it's the illness that made people become couch potatoes. So at these meetings, we had medical journals passed out to us. They would Xerox all the articles and we got to make phone buddies, which was a very helpful thing. And really joining the support group was the best thing that ever happened to me. So I highly recommend that if people with COVID long haulers can join a group, it would be great. It will help them a lot. Now, one of the medical journal articles was like a supplement. It was a whole booklet on itself and they gave one to each of us. And it detailed what was wrong with the brain. So there was nothing wrong with the structure of the brain, only the function. So when they started having functional MRIs, they could pick this up and find out. And they found many of the same problems in the people that they studied with chronic fatigue syndrome, Gulf War syndrome, and fibromyalgia. So this sounds kind of strange, but I went out and I purchased all kinds of puzzles to challenge my brain. I had a really hard time with sequencing, as I told you before. For example, I couldn't read the comic strips, my favorite thing, you know. I couldn't understand what was happening in box one to box two. And I bought myself some children's toys that taught me sequencing, their little cards. And then I got word search puzzles and other puzzles that you put together to create designs. I really wanted to force my brain cells to work. I was so, so scared, you know, I'm right. in my twenties and it's like, I'm falling apart like this, you know? Right. Oh and then I realized that most of the people in the group were worse off than I was. There was one woman who came in with her bedroom pillow and laid down on the floor throughout the meeting. And that's when I realized my nutrition knowledge was giving me an edge over other people. And I wanted to write about this illness. So I, I submitted some nutrition articles about eating with chronic fatigue syndrome to different journals for chronic fatigue syndrome. And then um, I published a book about the Boston Marathon. The Boston Marathon happens every April on Patriots Day in Boston. And it's one of the oldest marathons around. So first I published a children's picture book about this. And it's, it's a cute little bedtime story for children that are toddlers, maybe. And I was living on Heartbreak Hill and I had a friend and roommate who actually ran the Boston Marathon. And this is what propelled me to do that. I just felt uh, motivated, you know, after watching him. I saw how hard he worked at it. And then I started writing Too Tired to Cook, the guide to choosing foods that will boost your energy and enhance your immune system. How long did you have these symptoms? Like, you look amazing today. Um, you don't, are you still having the, those same um, symptoms? I would say some of them I do, but they're not as frequent. So they're not as disabling as they used to be. I'll get an occasional headache, but certainly not blinding headaches that I mean, I basically had to lay down with an ice pack behind my head. It was the only way I could get relief. Yeah. I, would, I would use milk. Milk has a substance in it that helps you calm down. Tryptophan that yeah. turns into serotonin. And since there was no medications I could tolerate, I pretty much would use milk. I would drink 16 ounces of milk to put me to sleep. So that, that was the only way I could get relief from the pain. And back then, the doctors didn't understand that dosages could be too high for everyone. 
I think dosages of medication were based on a man that was like 200 pounds. And I'm a woman 110 pounds back then. Right. And it just was not the right dosage for me. So of course, it would give me reactions. And then I noticed as time went on, doctors finally realized a half a pill can work if you're a smaller person, or if you have a, a sensitive body chemistry like I do. So the thing is, I didn't plan to write this book. It was kind of, I feel like, I had like divine inspiration or something that might have wrote it for me. And I'll tell you what happened. I was spending time with friends. This is in 2008 and it was President's Day and nobody in the house was awake at five o'clock in the morning. And I didn't want to go down the stairs because it was an old house and the stairs creaked something horrible. And then on top of that, the door, the front door stuck and it would crack. It made this huge cracking sound. So I just decided, all right, I'll stay in my room. And there happened to be a chair in the room and I just sat down. And I remember writing one paragraph. And I thought to myself, I don't know why I'm writing this. I just, I don't know where this is going to lead, but I have to write this stuff down. So I ended up writing five pages in one day. And I kept writing off and on for 12 years. And at first, my book was going to be called Feeding the Wilted. And then as the time came on to come to a publisher, I decided that wasn't a great title. That wasn't going to, to win my book. You know, nobody's going to want a book called that. So I changed it to Too Tired. But it was kind of my New Year's resolution every year that I'm going to take the papers off the bookcase and work on them. And so what I would do is update the references because in nutrition, the nutrition research is always changing and it can change like every four years or even more often than that. Mm -hmm. So this kept on going on. It was kind of like Mary being in a rut, never getting this book finished and not knowing how to finish it and not knowing what to do. And then I finished it in lockdown when we had COVID came and it changed everyone's lives. Oh, wow. That's incredible. And changed yours. It certainly did. Yes, it did. Mm -hmm. I can't imagine you being that person that you're saying that you were, because I don't see that when I look at you, you know, you mm -hmm. just. Yeah. Well, even throughout the whole illness, people would say to me, but you don't look sick. You don't look sick. It was maybe because of all the minerals and vitamins I was taking. And everybody at the support group would kind of say the same thing. None of us look sick, so we're not taken seriously by our doctors. And so nutrition, you think is, the, well, it was multiple things. Having a support mm -hmm. group, um, yep. having, you know, writing this book, focusing on your nutrition, focusing on foods that are good for you, that give you energy. Mm -hmm. um, and so that, is that what you would say most of the book um, is about? Well, my book starts with where you are when you're too tired to even look at your kitchen. It's like, oh my God, I have to cook a meal? <laughs> no. Yes. So what I do is I encourage people to go to the deli counter and get a bean salad. So that's your vegetable for the night. And then you can have chicken or um, fish. And I also have an emphasis on foods that are going to feel good for your GI tract. Because a lot of people with chronic fatigue syndrome and COVID long haulers, mm -hmm. their stomachs are not working correctly. And one of the things that research is finding is that the whole reason some people get COVID really bad and others don't has a lot to do with the critters in the intestine or the microbiome. They're not as, um, you have to have a variety of them in order to have a healthy immune system. Mm -hmm. And people are not having a healthy variety of nutrients and then there are microbes and not getting the food they need. Well, I have a question then. Based on your kind of recommended diet in your book, what would you say it's similar to? Because there's the Mediterranean diet, the keto, the intermittent fasting, flexitarian. Mm -hmm. What do you think your book mirrors? I think it's kind of a cross between the Mediterranean and the DASH diet. And the Mediterranean diet is the one that our friends in the Mediterranean countries like Spain and Greece and Italy consume. And their research has shown they have lower rates of chronic illness than we do with the United States. 
And for those who are unfamiliar with it, it has exercise as its base. Now, daily exercise, that's of course kind of an impossibility for people with COVID long haulers who could barely get to the mailbox or people with chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia. But it's also very important when you have fibromyalgia because we have muscles that are too short and too tense. We don't get into the deep stages of sleep where that's when your body relaxes and it also does repair work. So what we can do is mild stretching. And I've found that it's been helpful to go to something called yin yoga, Y-I-N. So I started going to yin yoga and then I worked my way up to vinyasa yoga, which is a nonstop movement process. It feels good. But when you're starting out, you don't have that kind of energy. Your muscles are not producing that kind of energy. The mitochondria are damaged. So you can do that mild stretching where you hold a pose for a much longer period of time. And a lot of them are done sitting or lying down. The Mediterranean diet is one that's filled with grains and breads, pastas, and nuts. That's a daily thing to eat nuts, and nuts are very good for you, as well as fruits and vegetables. But it differs from the American way of eating because meat is no longer the feature of the meal. It's not eaten every day even. It's at the top of the pyramid. There's a Mediterranean food diet pyramid, very different from the one that we have, the, uh, the, the American food pyramid. So it's a triangle up there near the sweet section. And you can eat meat in small amounts. So you wanna think of like having beef stew with vegetables rather than sitting down to a prime rib as your meal. Gotcha. And then what is the DASH diet? Well, I wanted to tell you one more thing about Mediterranean, okay. if that's okay. <laughs> yes. It features olive oil. It, it features extra virgin olive oil. Okay. And I grew up on that. It's, a, it's an oil, extra virgin has all of the impurities. Uh, it's, um, it's the most unprocessed and it's the healthiest form for you. It's good for the heart. It's good for the brain. It's good for the eyes. And you can't use it for high cooking, but high temperature cooking isn't good for us anyway. Now, the DASH diet has an emphasis on fruits and vegetables, and they are between nine and 11 servings a day. Oh, wow. Yeah, that yes. sounds like a lot. Yes. <laughs> it, it is a lot, especially, you know, if somebody is used to eating one fruit a week or something, or they just eat vegetables on yeah. Sunday. Or like a banana in the morning. And it's right. Like yeah. Nine bananas. So, wow. <laughs> yeah. But mine doesn't go quite up there. That's why I say it's between the two, you know. The DASH diet originally, it was intended for people with high blood pressure. So you're putting in all this potassium from the fruits and vegetables. And that way you're um, getting your sodium level down because you have to have a ratio of sodium and potassium in order to keep your blood pressure healthy. So you need to also increase your fiber because these foods are high in fiber and you need to have water to make sure that the fiber doesn't get clogged up and become like concrete inside your body. So my job is to help my clients increase their fiber intake and also um, little steps to take to get to that goal. Now, where I'm different is from the American Dietetic Association, which is now called ANDY, uh, the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. They are telling people over the age of two to have low fat milk. But where I differ in my book is I don't tell you to have low fat anything <laughs> actually, yeah. because we found there's a substance called CLA or conjugated linoleic acid. And it's an omega-6 fat that's not inflammatory. We're always told to have omega-3 fats from fish and flaxseed and hemp oil, but there's one omega-6, and this is the one, CLA, and it comes from cows and goats and lamb, animals that chew their cud. So in their bodies, it's created to a non-inflammatory substance, and it's really amazing because it helps people to lose weight. Yeah. And because it's found in the fatty portion of grass-fed milk, it's found in grass-fed beef, it's going to be helping you to have more satiety value, meaning your body isn't going to, it's going to be satisfied with the food you're eating instead of craving like chocolate chip cookies after you eat for right. hours after. Right. So it's, it's a very 
good thing. It comes in supplements, but I don't really recommend supplements. I like to get my people balanced with their diets first and get sources that are natural from foods. So you can get it from grass-fed butter, which is very expensive right now. It's like $7 a pound, but you just use a little bit. You don't have to use a lot. It's also found in goat's milk, like kefir or goat's cheese, okay. feta cheese, for example. And you can get it from sour cream and you can get it from grass-fed milk, but you have to buy the whole milk to get it. And yeah. you can also eat yeah. lamb. So those people who like to eat roasted lamb, leg of lamb, lamb chops, there's a good source for it. Oh, wow. Oh, that's interesting. No, because yeah, I'm a low fat, fat free uh, person. And yeah, so that's interesting. I'm going to. Yep. I'm a high fat person. <laughs> Yeah, but and yeah. you're you're you're, right very, you're slender and you're not you're not overweight. Um, right. This is incredible. So then, what would you recommend? Well, so if somebody wanted to get started, like mm -hmm. they're feeling this way, they just don't have the energy. Maybe it is their diet. What would you recommend for them to just start? What would be the first thing that you would recommend to help them? Like if they want to lose weight, maybe just, or maybe just want to have more energy. Mm -hmm. Well, we want to find out exactly what kind of a um, lifestyle a person is living. Every person who comes to me does what's called a three-day diet journal. So you're writing down every single thing that you eat and drink for three days. Usually it's two weekdays and one weekend day. And that's to give me an idea of what your lifestyle is like. Are you, for example, taking care of three children at breakfast and you're hurrying around and you have to put the homework in the backpack and run out the door and also feed your hungry husband at the same time? Or are you sitting down to breakfast living by yourself and it's a calm situation? Or are you just running out the door and grabbing something at the convenience food store? Mm. I have to know those kinds of things. And then we also go into what your goals are so that we can work on them step by step. And I also want to find out what kind of a dish you eat off of. There's all kinds of different size dinner plates, believe it or not. Some of them range from eight inches diameter to 10 or 12. So yeah. someone who's eating off a 12 inch diameter plate is getting a lot more food than someone who's eating off an eight inch for example. So that might be one of the things that would work on is having you eat from a different size plate. So it still looks full, but you'd be eating less. But preferably the smaller plate then. Yes. Depending on the person, if they need to lose weight. I have found that when people do the, 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 the three-day diet history, they're generally not eating enough food. I don't know if they do this because they want to look good on paper but I found that most people don't eat enough food. And so we have to add in food, especially things high in fiber, like fruits and vegetables. Oh. People are eating eight or 16 ounces of meat when you go to a restaurant. And that's way too much. I mean, it's yeah. like the, the recommended serving is actually four ounces or the palm of your hand. You can use the palm of your hand. That size is what you should be having as a serving. That's so interesting. So interesting. So what would you say your favorite chapter is in, your, in this entire book? My favorite chapter, I actually liked all of them, but I would have to say the probably the favorite one would be the ones with the charts that put together how to make organic meals. Oh, and, I love um, that. Let me see. So as a nutritionist, what would you, what was one of your biggest wins? Well, that would be How when I see it? people come in and they have achieved their goals and they walk in a little differently. They have a little swagger <laughs> because they're happy with what they're seeing in the mirror and there's a light in their eyes. And that is why I do my work because I see that. But back to the, my, my chapters in my book, I would say yeah. that, um, it was, I, I don't have like a whole lot of patience with myself doing spreadsheets. In fact, I hate doing them. So I created what I could, but my design editor, Rachel Ritchie, she did the most beautiful job creating something that was so ordinary into something extraordinary and beautiful. 
And she's on the West Coast. She's a writer herself. And so she writes children's books and young adult books. And we made a book come alive on two different coasts. And I, I just am amazed by that whole thing, you know. But I would say if I had a favorite chapter, it would be chapter seven. And that was called the fighter nutrients. And I'm talking about phytonutrients in it. And it's all about produce and how all the richly colored fruits and vegetables, the darker ones are actually better for you. They provide more nutrients and they're also better for the immune system. What would you recommend? Well, first off, you know what? Where can we get this book? If someone wants oh. to get a copy of it, where can we okay. get it? Okay. Um... <laughs> All right. My book can be purchased at Book Baby Book Shop. And it's also at Amazon and bondsandnoble.com. You can get a Kindle version if you want. And the other book, Daddy Trains for the Marathon, Yes. It can be purchased at Trafford, T R A F F O R D, publishing bookstore. And I'll put those notes in the show notes mm -hmm. of this episode as well. That is incredible. So, what would you recommend? Like, what would you want listeners to know about you and your path if they wanted to do the same thing, become a nutritionist? You did this as a part mm -hmm. of your health, it made you better. Right. Yeah, I feel like it saved my life, really, because there's a lot of illnesses that I've avoided having, just because I do have the nutrition knowledge. So what I would say is don't be afraid to try new things. If you don't like something, you can come back to it later. And there's always new avenues are opening up in different ways. I mean, when I studied nutrition, there was no such thing as a nutrition coach. And now you can be a nutrition coach, or you could be a nutritionist. And the jobs are not that much more different. I mean, the nutrition coach holds your hand more. So what we do is we create some goals that you want and we work towards step-by-step step getting to the goals. And it's kind of a lengthy process. It's not something you can call me up in one day and you're going to be all better or you're going to be losing weight. It's, it's a process. I like people to lose two pounds a week. Men happen to lose more men are lucky they get to lose three pounds a week they're just their metabolism is faster you know i have a question for you because i started doing something i started doing celery juicing mm -hmm. what are your thoughts on that so i do basically a 16 ounce glass every day i like to drink that myself i buy it at stop and shop all made so it's celery juice with lemon and okay. it alkalinizes the body. It's, it's very good. It's full of potassium. So it's very good for the heart muscle. It's good for all muscles, actually, because we need potassium. Well, is there anything else that you'd like to share today that, that we didn't um, get to cover? Yeah, I think I would like to talk about the symptoms of long haul as COVID because there may be some people out there who are suffering and wondering, well, do I have this or don't I have it? Yes. Because a lot of times people got COVID that was imperceptible and they don't realize, but they're suffering now. And I just recently watched a slide presentation by a Dr. David Cohen, and he presented long haulers. So this is very up to date. And some of the symptoms are fatigue, shortness of breath, or difficulty breathing, cough, joint pain, dizziness, orthostatic hypotension. And what that means is your blood pressure drops suddenly. So if you're like laying on the sofa watching television and the phone rings and you have one of the old fashioned phones you have to go and get to answer, you might feel very dizzy or lightheaded trying to get to the telephone. So you also have fever, uh, symptoms are all worse after activity, no matter which symptom, depression, anxiety, memory problems, muscle pain, headache, and loss of smell or taste. And my important piece of information here is don't be like me. My parents had told me I was hypochondriac. So they didn't want me writing a list of my symptoms to go to the doctor. They said, oh, you should just tell them one or two things and that's it. But that's not how doctors diagnose us. Doctors diagnose us by a cluster of symptoms. So if you just go in there and say, I'm tired, 
that means nothing. They're not even going to run some tests on you because everyone's tired at some point in life, right? right. Especially with a young mother <laughs> with young children hanging out, you know, chasing after them. So you really need to kind of um, get rid of that sensor inside of you that says, well, I might look like a hypochondriac because you have to tell the doctor everything that you're feeling. If you have itchy skin, you have to tell them. If you have visual problems, blurring or something, you have to tell him at the same time that you have the earache. He has to know those things. I, I can't emphasize that enough because that delayed my getting diagnosed. Not that there was any treatment right now at the time. There wasn't. But it's still, um, I don't know if it did any harm to me, but it, psychologically, I guess it did. Well, you lost friends and you, yes. your life was much different, you know, mm -hmm. and now, so now, and you know, now things change as you grow older, you have different things that you want to do, but now do you go to the movie theater? Yes. Yeah. So, and you can enjoy yeah. your, now I can enjoy a movie. I can watch something on TV and understand what's happening. <laughs> yeah. Yep. That's incredible. This has been so amazing. amazing. Nutrition can do a lot of different things for us, you know? I mean, it's just, it's pretty amazing when you think about it. So if and somebody they, wanted to set up a chat with you to just talk about what they could do to get mm -hmm. on the right, you know, path of yep. eating healthy, eating right for what fits their lifestyle, how do they reach out to you? Okay, well, I have an email. This is my business email, and that would be, Higgins, H-I-G-G-I-N-S, two M's, M-M, one, two, three, at gmail.com. And then we can set up appointments at the mindfulwayforward.com. I work with a doctor of hypnosis. It's a woman and she's wonderful and she has uh, great success with people. So you can do that. And it's all small letters, Higgins, MM123 at gmail.com. And the mindfulwayforward.com is also all small letters. Excellent. I'm going to have to reach out to you just to be, because like you said earlier, I don't know if I'm eating enough and mm -hmm. maybe it's just not the right, right things that I'm eating, you know, so, but this has been such a pleasure. It has been so wonderful meeting you. And oh, my pleasure on this end as well. Yes, thank, thank you, you so much for sharing your journey with us. And hopefully this can help someone, you know, get on the right path. I certainly hope so. Because there's a lot of people out there suffering. I have a friend actually, who has long COVID. She got it in November and she's still sick. <sighs> and she's very, very discouraged. No. Yeah. Well, is she help? Is she working with you like regarding nutrition? No, she, she started seeing somebody else. And I think it's, um, it's a female doctor who may be a naturopath and a functional medicine doctor, but okay. it's, it's a long, slow process because it depends on how, it depends on how much your microbiome or those critters in your intestine are off. I mean, one of the things my doctor started giving me, as I said, was the probiotics, but I wasn't able to tolerate a whole capsule. I had to actually open it up. And just take a tiny, tiny bit, a little at a time until I'd increase it up until that whole capsule. So I understand when people's intestines are so far off. And that happens from medication. It happens from eating processed foods. Mm, I'm guilty of that. I love processed foods, fried food, everything. Yeah, terrible exactly. For you. Love it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you again for sharing your time with us. And this is thank so you, Bonnie. Amazing. I hope you have a great day. You too.